this year's Tabula Poetica reading series. This is the fifth year for this project to bring poets to Chapman University to read their work and to talk with us about poetry. I want you to mark your calendars for our one remaining event this semester. It's our MFA student reading, and it's always a really terrific event where I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen. So I encourage you all to join me for that. That's December 16th at 4 p.m. in Fish Interfaith Center. I'm going to talk for just a couple of minutes while you pull out your cell phone and silence it so that it doesn't go off during the reading. As you're doing that, and also um, you're welcome to get up and grab some refreshments at the back of the room. As you're doing those things, I want to thank some of the people and organizations that make Tabula Poetica possible. Most of the support from this project comes from the English department. So I want to especially thank the chair, Joanna Levin, who's doing a fantastic job, and my two graduate assistants, David Krausman and Erica Hoffmeister, and also Debbie Thacker, who's our administrative assistant, and she does all the logistical work for the whole series. In addition, Leatherby Libraries and Fish Interfaith Center continue to be great hosts for these events. And we're right now in Leatherby Libraries, and this room has been a wonderful venue for our visiting poets for several years now. This year, and especially for today's event because it's Veterans Day, we also have support from the Dean of Students Office and the Department of History. And so these co-hosts have made today possible for Tabula Poetica. We are also grateful, as always, to small grants from poets and writers through a grant that they receive through the James Irvine Foundation. I want to mention that this afternoon's reception is hosted by Leatherby Libraries, and the Dean, Charlene Baldwin, is at the back of the room, so let's give her a, a big hand. <laughs> this year is the library's 10th anniversary, and this event is part of their 10th anniversary celebration, and Charlene especially has been an enthusiastic supporter of Tabula Poetica. She also reminded me today that the library now houses the Center for American War Letters, and so that's a project that's very much connected to the kinds of poetry you'll hear today and the things that Laureen said at her afternoon talk. Um, it's a new collection donated by Andy Carroll, and we already have some students and classes working with this collection. So it's really bringing the letters of all the American wars, all the wars that America has been involved with um, into the hands of student researchers. After the reading, we'll have a little bit of time for question and answer. We also have Lorene's book available up here at the front. That's $12. I know some of you already have her book, and she's very happy to stay around for a few minutes to sign those books. This afternoon, I'd like to welcome Daniele Strupa. He's the chancellor of Chapman University and our institution's future president. I first met him when I interviewed for my current job, and his innovative and interdisciplinary approaches are part of what keeps me here at Chapman, and also keeps me very busy. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to have an academic administrator who is both a practicing mathematician and an appreciator of poetry. Daniele also recognizes that while our individual our individual scholarly pursuits and artistic practices are vital. Collaboration allows us to become more than the sum of our parts. In that sense, we gather today to explore art, history, and culture together. I'm very pleased to welcome the Chancellor and have him introduce the poet. Good evening. Thank you very much, Anna, for having me here tonight. I can't tell you how refreshing it is after a day in which I run from meeting to meeting to meeting. Uh, I am late at 9 o'clock. I'm already late. And then the meetings uh, go one over the other. And finally, to get a moment in which I can step back and, and breathe for, for a while. 
Uh, I'm glad that Anna reminded us of uh, our first meeting because I was going to gonna talk about that. Uh, when we sat and for that interview, one of the things we, we discussed was the great power that poetry has to slow us down. And that was one of the conversation we had. You know, right now our life are always so fast and we read without paying attention to words very much anymore. We read a newspaper article to get to the, to the, the punchline, we wanna know what happened. We read a report or we write a report and we really don't take the time to celebrate what I think is really the sacred value of the word, both the spoken word and the written word. Uh, in this, you know, Anna mentioned I'm a mathematician. For me, numbers have a sacred value as well. Yeah, and I think that really both words and numbers take us back to a wisdom that is really difficult to hang on to. And the only thing that brings us back to the sacred value of the word is literature, and in particular, poetry, where every single word plays a fundamental role. Just like when we listen to a piece of music, every beat, every note, every silence has a role and we look at a painting and every stroke of the brush has a value, so in a piece of poetry, every single word, every single silence, every pause has a value. So thank you for having me here. Um, I wanna thank Anna also for the tremendous work that she's done by being persistent in maintaining the value and the importance of poetry in the hearts of our students and our colleagues, and this wonderful full room of people is really a testament to that. And I wanna just say thank you for that. And of course, uh, Veterans Day, it's, it's a very special day, and so uh, it seems so appropriate to have a poet with us to help us commemorate the lives of those who have been affected one way or another from the war. Those who went to war and those who stay home to wait for them. Those who went to war willing to go and those who went uh, maybe against their own will, not so excited. Those who became heroes by chance and those who became heroes by direct action. It is important that all of these people are remembered by us today. Lorraine Delaney Ullman is a professor at the University of California Irvine, our neighbors here, and is the author of an acclaimed prose poem collection called Camouflage for the Neighborhood, which in 2011 won the Sentence Award. She describes the poetry by saying, and I quote, from toy guns to wheat cover bunkers, this series of prose poems examine the ways the franchises of war pervade our daily lives and the complicity that the speaker, her family, and her suburban hometown endure, but also share in the propagation of violence." End quote. Her work has appeared in numerous uh, literary journals, including the international journal House Chapman itself, uh, TAB, the Journal of, po of Poetry and Poetics. In the spirit of what Anna was saying about interdisciplinary and collaborative work, she has also collaborated with uh, the visual artist Jody Servon on an interdisciplinary project about the objects that people save from their loved ones. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lorraine Delay Ullman. Thank you, that was a lovely introduction. And it is, it is truly wonderful to be here uh, on Veterans Day um, at Chapman University. And again, I wanna th thank Anna um, for her hard work and, and keeping a reading series afloat because it, it really does take persistence. Um, and um, I also would like to um, thank all, all the men who and women who have served and who have made sacrifices for our country. Um, today is Veterans Day. And that is an important thing to, to keep in mind. Uh, my own father, who is actually sitting here today, he's a veteran of the Korean War and I'm, I'm happy to have him at the poetry reading with my parents. So actually, I thought I would start with two poems that are not my own. Um, I wanted to start with one of the classic uh, war poems um, by Wilfred Owens, who is considered to be one of the greatest poets of war poetry in the English language. Um, he writes from personal experience, intense personal experience uh, during World War I, and in fact was killed on November 4th, so basically a week before um, the first armistice, uh, November 11th. And then because I was talking about um, earlier today the contemporary war poem, I'm going to read uh, a, another poem um, that's not my own, that's by James Doyle, um, kind of to, to bookend it because it's also about uh, the Great War and I think it's kind of an interesting contrast between 
reading a poem that was probably written in 1917, 1918, and then reading one that's from the current time frame. So the first poem is um, by Wilford Owen, and it's, it's titled Anthem for Doomed Youth. And it's a traditional sonnet, and the only thing that you probably might not know is that a shire is a county in Great Britain. Anthem for Doomed Youth by Wilford Owen. What passing bells for these who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns. Only the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle can patter out their husty orisons. No mockeries now for them, no prayers, no bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall, their flowers the tenderness of patient minds, and each slow dusk a drawing down of blinds. And then this second one by James Doyle is titled the city's oldest known survivor of the Great War. And James Doyle, he, he is the author of two books of poetry. He currently lives in Colorado. I've never met him, actually. Um, found this poem on the Poetry Foundation website. The city's oldest known survivor of the Great War marches in uniform down the traffic stripe at the center of the street, counts time to the unseen web that has rearranged the air around him, his left hand stiff as a leather strap along his side, the other saluting right through the decades as if they weren't there, as if everyone under 90 were pervasive fog the morning would dispel in its own good time, as if the high school ban all flapping thighs and cuffs behind him were as ghostly as the tumbleweed on every road dead-ended in the present. All the ancient infantry shoulder right through a skein of bone, presenting arms across the drift. Nothing but empty graves now to round off another century. The sweet honey of the old cadence, the streets going by at attention, the banners glistening with dew, the wives and children blowing kisses. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of context um, for camouflage for the neighborhood. Um, and I had talk, talked about this a little bit earlier today, so hopefully it won't be too repetitive. But the original um, inspiration was a, a little army man, which you can see down here near the books. Um, I have a, this tendency to, to look down when I walk. Um, I've been actually trying to fix that. <laughs> um, look up. And um, so I was looking down, walking through a parking lot, and I found a little army man next to a, a car tire, and I picked him up. I, I seem to pick up objects off the ground. And it just, you know, kind of struck me finding this lone soldier in the middle of a parking lot. And I put him in my pocket and totally forgot about it until weeks later I put on the same coat, put my hands in my pocket, and, and there it was again. And it just, it ended up becoming this catalyst um, to kind of remind me that um, I am part of the, the military industrial complex, that I am both the, uh, a participant and a spectator in how we perpetuate war in this country. And that realization was somewhat devastating to me um, because I did think that I was anti-war. And, and I have a background actually, um, which kind of made things even more complicated, that I used to work for a defense company. I worked for Boeing for 10 years. So I've really seen various sides of war, not only in my own day-to-day, um, -day, you know, waking up in the morning to actually going to work and working for a defense company that's making warplanes. Um, so really the book is kind of at a crossroads. It's, a, it's this junction of trying to understand how war mediates, um, how, we, how we mediate through war, essentially, uh, through our, our culture, and, and perhaps even how our lives become a product of war. So thematically, the book really addresses various things um, because it is talking about everyday lives. So it, it ranges from um, childhood to child rearing to um, working for war um, to um, 
actually grandchildren, and, and so it has a quite a, a wide variety. And the book is a book of prose poetry. So uh, for me, I didn't want to title them individually. Um, so none of the poems in the collection have titles. The, the title is Camouflage for the Neighborhood as one encompassing title. Um, so when I do read, I will read and pause between each prose piece um, as I'm reading. Brain geography. Does killing begin with the pulling the wings from insects with salt on a snail? A child will make weapons from anything, a stick, a fork, a pencil. My two-year-old grandson points to his toy knight and says, bad guy. No, I tell him, good guy. As kids, we watched Leave it to Beaver and Lassie were in bed before the evening news. The next door neighbors teased my brother because he looked like the beeve. We owned a mutt, not a collie, named Jackie. My parents bought bedroom furniture at Sears, listened to the radio on the way home. Missiles in Cuba, a naval blockade of the island. In our neighborhood, no one built a bunker. We didn't even stock up on food or water. He enlisted in the Navy to avoid being drafted by the Army. The Korean War, my dad's war, though we never saw any action. Stationed in San Diego, a Midwesterner's dream. From the ship at sea, he wrote love letters, 60 to my mother, one dear Jane letter to Illinois. My brother played Army man. Our mother sewed his fatigues from old sheets, sponge painted them green and yellow, camouflage for the neighborhood. With a gun fashioned from wood, he aimed. No girls allowed in the fort. For his 12th birthday, our mother decked my brother's cake with a squad of Marines. We sang, he blew out the candles, then we licked frosting off the feet of men. Clocks stopped. Even in grayscale, the destruction wasn't lost. A child's lunchbox tied to ash and bone. What were we, seven or eight years old, when Mrs. Risco exposed us to the photographs of Hiroshima? I had nightmares. My mother called the principal to complain. The heart is a magnificent cathedral. The lower chambers receive blood from the atrium. These rooms fill with blood, pump it outward. Beware the symptoms of constricted flow, shortness of breath, the, volat the voltaic burn across the chest, throbbing jawbone. I'd like to say that the body is one of God's conditional promises. If I want an explanation, is it God or lack of God? The burn, the breath, the jawbone, People say it's luck or a blessing. I say it's evidence. The psychic tells me not to worry. Alongside the freeway, rows of weed-covered bunkers, not fallout shelters, each mound a cache of munitions, warheads, missiles, bombs, stockpiling since World War II. The naval station shares its boundaries with an estuary, home to three endangered species, the California Lease Tern, building Savannah Sparrow, the light-footed Clapper Rail. Their refuge along the Pacific Flyway, here wetlands and weapons. During the duck and cover drill, Priscilla farted. Even Miss Daly giggled. All of us under our desks, our fourth grade hands hugging our necks, knees aching from the cold linoleum. That was the year Miss Daly had her car accident and didn't return to school. The first time I cheated on a spelling test. And the year my grandmother heard gunshots. 
On the next block, Watts burned. One fifth of my hometown was once an army air base. Eager cadets became pilots, navigators, and bombardiers. After VJ Day, the land and buildings were converted into schools, the county fairgrounds, and city hall. Land banking made men rich. Lima beans and celery cleared from the fields were replaced by track houses built on raised foundations. Our streets had Irish names, Watson, Dublin, and Shamrock linked into a three block loop. We didn't live in a Cinderella home with scroll work and fascia board. Our house was basic ranch. From the front porch, we had a peekaboo view of Disneyland's Matterhorn and its fake snow cap until everything civic sprawled. Next door, a German physicist with five children. What frightened me was the mad Italian woman, her grappling hold on her young son too strong. Hollering for my mother, she broke down on our steps late one night. Her husband and parents hauled her away. Around the block, a retired Marine raised and saluted the Stars and Stripes at 0600. I've seen all the memorials in DC, wa in Washington, DC. The week before 9-11, I walked the length of the National Mall in the humidity of late summer. In front of Lincoln, I thought of Martin Luther King Jr. I stood in the shadow of marble and its cool, sleek echo. I crossed the mall and walked to 10th Street, Ford's Theater, sat in the front row, waited for the performance to begin. There was no performance, only Booth's Derringer. I felt it in my teeth and gums. War is in the news today. Guerrilla, civil, terror, drugs. Get in, shoot, kill, get out. My daughter dated an ex-Marine. He drank beer, bought her speed. She was 15. I thought she was safe. You won't feel this, the nurse says, when she injects the isotope into my vein. I taste a quickening, metal on my tongue, the kind used to poison ants and rats. The technician angles the gamma camera near my heart. This won't touch you. For 10 minutes, the machine makes pictures. I close my eyes. When will I feel? Who will touch me? Our Girl Scout troop pitched tents for day camp in the local wildlife or slumber partied in the park clubhouse. Everything ended with singing. We promised to try. My brother and his friends were Boy Scouts. They camped and hiked into the Sierra Nevada backcountry, fished for rainbow trout, learned to shoot air rifles. I quit Girl Scouts to chase boys, coaxed my dad into taking me backpacking. We hiked nine miles to Peeler Lake. Surrounded by glaciated granite, the snowmelt lake was eerie quiet. Neither of us said much. We slept under the conifers and stars. No song or roasted marshmallows. In the morning, mosquito bitten, I tried not to scratch the welts. I tried to like it. All seven rifles in my great uncle's gun cabinet were loaded. The black barrels gleamed, mirrored themselves in the polished glass door. Hunting rifles for duck, deer, and dove. Every holiday, one of us kids jimmied that door to see if it was locked. It always was. We feasted on venison, bear stew, tender quail. I witnessed my first kill at Lake Shasta, a rattlesnake near the water's red mud edge. My father's Navy buddy shot it with a revolver. A quick kill, no one knew he had a gun. Because we were safe, we moved on to another campground and the possibility of more. The draft ended before my brother's number was called. 
we watched the first lottery on television, a small black and white. The capsules gray in the tall glass container, each with a birth date hidden inside. A congressman drawing the first capsule, another and another, as if they were pills. Polio gave my grandfather a lopsided leg. He joined the army anyway. Before he left for boot camp, he poured a heart from resin, glued a tiny DC-3 in the center, a parting gift for his second wife-to-be. The army sent him home. The rigors of marching were too much for a man with so much desire. Aerospace Alley. I'd swerve the car around a lusty patch of ice plant before the exit emptied onto Lakewood Boulevard and then into a lengthy, dimly lit tunnel, the last strip of my 40-minute commute. My brother got me the job. Three of us girls sat at a long table, shared two chunky computers. At lunch, we would played cards with the men. I'd shuffle and deal hearts, shoot the moon to win. My Barbie tried to love G.I. Joe, but he had married war. I liked to take his clothes off, helmet, combat boots, and olive drab fatigues. Joe seemed manlier than Ken, Joe with his rippled muscles, bendable knees, and elbows. He had as many accessories as Barbie, dog tags, parachute pack, his carbine rifle. My son reminds me how he and his friends set up their plastic armies, let our pet rat Spot run through the regiments, and whoever had the most soldiers left standing won the war. Or they used marbles, bloodies, swirls, and shooters rolled across the floor, aimed to knock over as many an ordinary flick of the wrist would do. There were no playbacks or do-overs, just keepsies. No longer allies, my son surrendered his men to John and Joseph, who lived down the street. No skyline, it used to be like Mayberry, small town Southern California where the words town and city are interchangeable by law. Poised atop a coastal tableland, 16 square miles, today it's an edgeless city. My dad was driving us home from a camping vacation when Apollo 11 landed in the sea of tranquility. From the car radio, we heard Armstrong as he walked the moon. I was scared of what he would find there. How the mind disables the heart. In the television screen above my bed, a reflection of the window outside the not so distant sea like a family heirloom, this hospital. My brother and I were born here. I gave birth to a daughter. We're an alien brood, an assortment of surgeries, accidents, and diseases. What's the relation of mind to brain? As a child, I nursed my mother through misdiagnosed lupus. But I'm not good with the sick, the infirm. My own children, I left with her to make well. She tended their fevers, rashes, and runny noses. Through the Second World War, my grandmother Thelma and her sister Val Jean worked the swing shift at the Chrysler plant. They wore the cleanest overalls, afternoon fresh makeup, perfect hair donning hairnets, and left the children to take care of the children. They didn't know they were making history. One mishap. A hot rivet fell and glanced Thelma's forehead long enough to embed a piece of a B-29 bomber above her brow. My mother remembers this. Aunt Valjean brought her home in the middle of the night. That small bit stayed with her. I wasn't rosy. I didn't weld or assemble parts. Instead, the old boys called me a budgeteer or bean counter asked me if I was single. I'd match my fuchsia nails to suit and shoes, figure how many man hours it would take to build their planes, clicked my heels through their long corridors. The pay was that good. (laughs) 
We called it the airplane park. Near the swing set and the seesaw, Jane and I danced the length of its hot fuselage, skipped across its wings. What we fingered was not the military crest or the missing cannons from the nose, not the dogfight near the Yalu River, but the sea of yellow sand below, the milk and water sky above the Navy jet beached in our lot. The town's first park, now full of vagrants and homeless, still hosts the venerable fish fry every May, carnival rides and raffles. The day after last Christmas, teenage boys shot three dozen paintballs at a homeless man sitting at a picnic table reading, left him blind in one eye. In high school, my son was recruited for war as soon as tomorrow or next week. The sergeant called, had a quota to make. They talked like men negotiating a sweet deal. His friends enlisted. Chris wanted to be a photographer, Mark a senator someday. Soldiers returning from Vietnam kissed the tarmac. Protesters booed, spat upon those who served. I knew boys from the neighborhood who had joined. Mike became an officer who held the keys to unlock the nuclear launch. Another learned to weld, a trade that made him a wealthy man. Paul spent two years in Okinawa, witnessed a regime change in China, the fall of Cambodia and Saigon. If I consider the possibility of conscription, I would send my son to Canada if Canada were still an option. I was a single mother of two when I saw Tom Cruise as Maverick. Betrayed by his haircut, a military man sat next to me. I felt the weight of his forearm against the seat, the way his chest leaned into every fight scene. And I can't forget how the music surged, that rush when the two fighter jets go canopy to canopy. We both came undone. Help struggling vet. From a car window, a hand offers him relief. Is it a five or a 10? Does he sleep in doorways, in boxes, or crates on the ground? It's easy. Roll down the window, pull the bill from your wallet, wave it into the air. The woman in the sedan behind me yawns. The van in front chokes out more exhaust. The traffic light goes green. I look away and accelerate through. The reporter sees the flare of the bomb above Beirut before he hears it. A mile away, he says to us. In the middle of an air raid alert, a well-lit brooder full of young chicks on my great-grandmother's screened porch. They had to be kept warm she drew the blackout curtains to disguise the light from bombers cruising the California coast. With a candle, she fussed over the birds, set the drapes ablaze. Fourth of July, rockets red glare, bombs bursting in air. This summer, we waited for fireworks lit from a barge in the bay. Some of us enjoy the sound more than the bloom. On the aircraft carrier USS Philippine Sea, my father repaired Sky Raider and Panther jets, watched the ordnance handlers push their loads beneath waiting wings. Three of the men posed with bombs they decorated like eggs. Happy Easter, listen to this one, it will kill you. They're the flip side of fertility. Danny swallowed a bullet. His tongue flipped it down his throat during math. Mrs. Hart was furious. You know, she said, when you're 18, they'll draft you, and you don't even have the right to vote. You'll be swallowing bullets then. I imagined this as she yanked on Danny's collar and hauled him off to the principal's office. We heard the doctor ordered laxatives. This one would slip through. 
We went hunting with a daisy. The shooter was my boyfriend, the driver his best friend. I was in the back seat of the Camaro. My love cocked the air rifle, looked for a target as we turned the streets. There, a bare-chested boy went watering the lawn. He aimed the muzzle between the ribs, the sweet pot spot, he said, releasing the trigger. Its hollow pop and pellet made the boy howl and look at me. We sped away, the driver and shooter lapping in the front seat. She labored for hours. I left the room for sleep, returned in time for the delivery. My daughter gave birth to a son. We gazed at the nurse who held his head, head in one hand, lathered his black hair over the basin with the other. Today on our patio, he imagines his hands are guns, shoots at the flowering pots of azaleas all afternoon. I don't like guns, I say to him. They're pretend, pretend, he says. The dead local soldiers listed in the Sunday paper, Robert, Eric, Felipe, 19 or 20, enlisted boys because they didn't know what else to do. I drink a cup of black tea, eat toast with peanut butter and jam, read each column not knowing what I'm looking for. My son was once a fitness trainer, then sold mortgages. These days he waits tables at a French bistro, tends the bar full of regulars. The sale of armies and plastic dwindled. So the makers cast new colors, neon yellow, orange, and blue. 50,000 toy soldiers molded each day their M16 rifles and grenades battle ready, every batch packaged with a paper American flag. I found one last night in the theater parking lot, a three-inch man kneeling with a bazooka. I have confined him to my, my pocket. A stranger tells me it's a beautiful day. I thank the man who opens the door for me and he says, you're welcome. Six zucchinis roll across the check stand, unfurled by loose plastic. The blonde-haired girl packs my groceries in double bags, just in case. I push the cart to my car. I'm traveling on their tailwind, their breath, my body. Thank you. Um, it wasn't my first choice. <laughs> it originally wasn't my first choice. I actually wrote a few of these pieces in lines. Um, but I was having such a hard time with the material, and I have a background of a tech writer. Um, that's what I did when I was at the Boeing Company. And so I was having a hard time writing the lyric, yet this background of a tech writer kept coming in, which is very straightforward and um, practical. I would say, and economic <laughs> even. And I found a way into the material by actually writing it in, in prose. Um, and then part of the issue for me by writing it in prose was why it needs to be prose poetry. And I felt like I needed to do additional work with that in terms of um, sonic constructions and rhythm and word choice to make sure that the poem still had some of those elements that we so love in poetry in terms of musicality and because I did not have lineation to depend on, um, it really made me pay attention to the sentence structure. And that actually was a really good learning experience for me. Okay, she's asking who are some of my inspirations. Um, well, 
I, I did read Brian Turner and Dina McHale, um, both poets of war poetry, but um, another one of my inspirations was um, a book called um, hang out, Safekeeping by Abigail Thomas, and she writes in these very short vignettes, and that's kind of what I was striving for um, in Camouflage. Um, another book that I read um, was, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, um, oh, it is the um, Waldy book, the one about Lakewood, which is, now I can't think of the title. I will remember it in a second. Um, another book that actually has very short vignettes. Um, so I was kind of like studying that, that form in a way. Um, and then I read David Shields' um, manifesto on, um, I think it's the reality manifesto, which is r it's just a fun, fun read about nonfiction and about um, fact and fiction. Um, because that was becoming an issue as well, because um, I was really writing biographically, but still I was writing poetry. Did I have to be, you know, completely factually uh, true to what was happening, or could I tweak that? And I actually ended up tweaking it some. Um, and he kind of gave me permission to do that, <laughs> actually. So uh, David Shields, I would highly recommend his work, actually. Um, and then I think... Um, Let's see, who else do I read? I read a lot of nonfiction. I probably read more nonfiction than, than novels, actually. Point of view in terms of Oh, with why I wrote with I. Um, because, I mean, because it is biographical, I think I probably chose that as the, uh, something that was the most comfortable, um, although that can be also be very uncomfortable. Um, I had to really kind of give up on trying to hide things, essentially, and that, uh, that actually is har harder to do than you imagine it's going to be. You think that it's going to be easy when you're writing to tell the truth, and it's just, it, it takes a lot of work, actually. Um, I, I always strive for that kind of emotional truth, yet that is, it's very difficult to sometimes catch up with it. That's a really good question. <laughs> yes, my family's sitting right here. Um, th that I mean, I'm writing a memoir right now, and I'm still running into this issue. So it, I mean, that's an issue. I have, I can't tell you how many panels at AWP I have been on, or I've been to, to try to find the answer to that question. Um, for me, again, I do, It's you. You have to weigh certain things. Um, I always really want to be true, and I want the emotional truth to be the most evident. So if I can achieve an emotional truth by maybe tweaking something slightly that, that means I'm going to save the feelings of my brother, for example, I might do that. Um, or I might just say, you know, they're never going to read this, but <laughs> that actually doesn't turn out to be true. Um, and I, I've heard that story time and time again of, of, of authors who thought that their families would never read their work and then guess what? Somehow they find it and they read it and then there, you know, there's all these issues with telling the truth. So you, it's, I think it's better to just kind of be upfront about it. And I mean, my mother has given me a, a lot of information and I will email her and say, you told me this story. Can you give me a few more details? And um, so I would have constant communication with her. And I actually had communication with other people as well. Um, there's a couple pieces about ex-boyfriends in here. I, I emailed them. Um, and I'm currently writing a memoir, and, and, and t it's really tough to, because that really does have to be based on <laughs> truth. Um, and it's really tough to understand what can I reveal without um, hurting my family, or do I have to, or is my job just to reveal it, and then I have to deal with the aftermath of that. I'm 
I'm going to answer it in the same way <laughs> that I answered earlier today. Um, I, I think I said two things. One, I, I usually have more than one project that's ongoing, and that helps keep me involved. So, for instance, if one project's not really working, I have something else to turn to. Um, that really works for me, actually, to have more than one thing going on. But the second thing uh, that I would highly recommend is actually collaborative work. And I am currently collaborating with an artist um, who is a photographer, and she actually does a lot of installations as well. And that has just completely opened up my work and my creative ideas about about art, about um, writing. I mean, it's really opened up a lot of different landscapes from that perspective. And and because I wasn't an artist, I g I got to learn all these new things about art, um, from how to install it in a gallery and um, and working with somebody. And she's she's on the East Coast. So, you know, we email, we talk on the phone, we see each other maybe probably about twice a year, um, and we madly, you know, work for two days in a row, and then we go away and, and do our thing, and um, it's a collaborative project that's been going around the United States, essentially, from gallery to gallery, so we're pretty happy about that, and, um, but I would highly recommend collaborative work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.